was listening actually the other night, uh, one of his little skits that was on Showtime. And, you know, he was talking about God. And he goes, it, it, you think God is going to listen to you when all this other <laughs> shit is going down? Think about it. You know, there's no such thing as God. You know, and, and it was kind of really funny, you know, just, you know, his attitude towards saying. But it was interesting about him that. You know, here you get on stage, right, and and do all his, you know, little things, right? But uh, I was reading that he really kind of, like, hung around, you know, just with his immediate friends, like a couple of them, and didn't socialize with any other entertainers or anything like that. Yes, very true. Matter of fact, uh, as the backstage host at Universal Studios Amphitheater, I would always be uh, hosting the parties after the show, which were big events, and everybody, there was anybody wanted to get backstage after the show to kind of schmooze and try to get their next gig and all that stuff and talk with the rest of the folks, but George Carlin didn't have those those parties after his show. He was a one-man guy. He'd come in and do his uh, time and do it well, and then he would just sit around, relax, and then uh, go back to the hotel. There was no major hubbub or anything like that to his shows oh yeah yeah the world missed a great uh, comic and not just a, t- uh, a comic he actually was a great thinker and the older he got he was not scared to share that information was he exactly he was uh, a very good social philosopher and i really enjoyed um listening to him because believe it or not i think i've told you gary i actually grew up in the next tenement over from George Carlin on 121st Street in Amsterdam, right across from Columbia University when I was a kid. And he was uh, probably eight years older than myself, so he was one of the big guys on the block we didn't mess around with. But uh, I can't believe he was from the old neighborhood. Oh, yeah. And, boy, he is missed, I'll tell you that. I mean, yeah, I tell you, when he passed, that kind of affected me the same way almost as when Art passed. I mean, that really, you know, when Art passed, it actually, I hate to say this, about a month before he passed on, I just want to share this with the listeners out there, Art Bell, we were talking, you know, and he kept saying, or we were actually texting at this point, he was texting, you know, Gary, you're too old to keep riding those Harley motorcycles, you know, you're getting too old, you know. And he was at the time, I think, what, maybe seven or eight years older than me. And, you know, and I, and I said to him, but Art, you're not that old, you know. And he goes, <laughs> I'm, he goes, I'm too old. He goes, I'm just too old for, you know, it, it, like it's like he knew something was coming. Uh, he just wow. kept saying that he was just too old. You know, and I, I said, well, have you thought about even getting on and, and getting back on and doing weekends or filling in? And he just says, I'm too old. Wow. You know, is this, you could see the, the big difference in him, his, his, you know, because, I mean, he was like me. Of anybody, I mean, he was such a radio freak one way or another. I mean, from, you know, broadcasting yeah. to amateur radio. I mean, that was his whole life. That was probably 80% of his life. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I just think that is a touching story that you tell about how uh, Art was talking with you in his last days. We didn't know they were his last days, but, uh, you know, it sounds to me, Gary, that he was basically passing the mantle on to you. Not uh, really. He, he, you were... really. No, I, I take that back. He, he really wanted Heather Wade to succeed. You know, he really, you know, uh, had sure. a lot of faith in her, had a lot of faith in her. Uh, you know, I was giving him a few tips because he asked me to, you know, monitor her show and then, you know, give him my feedback, you know. And I gave him some feedback and I noticed a big change in how, you know, she was doing her show. Now, I don't know if he said, hey, a friend of mine told me about this. He maybe just told her, hey, you need to do this or do that. Because sometimes you need to have somebody else out there, you know, listening to you know, that you can somewhat trust. Yes. Yeah, but, I mean, nobody can be an Art Bell, okay? And nobody can go on the radio and try to impersonate Art Bell because you'll never be an Art Bell. So I, I right. it really, sometimes when people say like with me, you know, that you're like the next Art Bell, it really offends me because I'm not trying to be Art Bell, you know, I, I'm in between Mr. Rogers and George Carlin. Okay, let's be honest. 
<laughs> Very good. <laughs> now, getting back well, to you, he, now you're a lawyer. Now, you, you're, yeah. you, you created this team to go out and find UFOs and Bigfoot and, and orbs and all the strange things that, that happen out there. Now, have you ever sat and wondered what this is going to do to my law practice? Or did you just kind of, you know, I can honestly say what I'm going to say. We're not on any stations at this point, right? So I can say this. The FCC isn't going to get me with a fine, you know? <laughs> or did you feel like, I don't give a shit? Yeah. Well, I tell you what, Gary, I had always been interested in the paranormal and the UFOs and Bigfoot and all those subjects just fascinated me. Even growing up before I even had any clue that I was going to be a lawyer. Matter of fact, uh, I didn't go to law school till later in life. I was uh, 32 years old when I went to law school. I already had a family and uh, decided I wanted to change careers after my showbiz stint. Uh, and so even during the time I was uh, practicing full-time, uh, that's kind of something I would talk about and go to meetings. I was a MUF, I was involved with MUFON since uh, 1994. Uh, I was uh, Peter Davenport's attorney for many, many years, probably 24 years at this point, uh, working with him in the National UFO Reporting Center, uh, and Dr. Richard Haynes, uh, the NARCAP uh, scientist who takes all the uh, professional pilot reports of UFOs. I've always kind of done pro bono legal work for, you know, paranormal organizations that needed to have just some general legal things done. Uh, and then uh, as I got older, I just decided, hey, I, I uh, am not going to have to worry about this anymore. I've, I've developed a uh, reputation as a good lawyer and a good counselor and a counselor at law, and so uh, I don't I don't mind anymore when people uh, call me the paranormal lawyer, <laughs> and I'm kind of enjoying it in my older age. <laughs> well, I can tell you this. I mean, your last show you were on, I mean, you hit tens of thousands of people were listening to all the replays on all the different apps. I mean, I was so shocked. Uh, you know, I, I really think, you know, what you have uh, to offer is – you know, uh, quite a bit. And I can't wait when you start taking some call-ins from, you know, the listeners, you know, where they can even ask you a little bit of, you know, paranormal legal questions where you can kind of give them a general idea, you know, if they have a case or not have a case or, or what have you. I mean, your show is so rich with your background, your group and all this stuff and your knowledge oh, and your connections. Oh, come on. That'll well, be, that'll be $10. Yes, thank you for that, Gary. That was a great promo right there. And thank you. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, the idea uh, is that there are uh, certain things that uh, the legal profession, the law, and the paranormal kind of intersect. And I would like to be there to be able to help people through those questions about, uh, hey, what do, you do? what do you do when you want to sell your house and you know it's haunted? Or you have a feeling that it might be haunted. Do you need to disclose that in the sales documents, you know, when you do something like that? Um, all sorts of interesting subjects that come up, even when you're potentially, if you're out there doing investigations, you know, on UFOs or Bigfoot, uh, do you need to get permission from the property owner? Do you need to find out which property you are squatching on before you go out there? Those kinds of issues are very important. Um, I have never had an opportunity yet to represent a ghost or a UFO alien, but you never know. There's something like that in my future down the road. Who knows? No question. I mean, you don't handle these type of cases, but okay, I'm out there. Let's just pretend now. This is not a true story. I'm out there, right? And I am out in the middle of the woods. I got my 30 odd six with me, right? And I have a lot of ammo with me. And all of a sudden, I see a Bigfoot. And in my mind, I th I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill this Bigfoot for there's proof that they're Bigfoot ex exists. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to shoot it, kill it, take its head off, you know, bring its head back along with whatever I need to prove that there was a Bigfoot because who knows what's going to happen to the body afterwards. Of course, on their hand, if you kill a Bigfoot, you might be killed really fast afterwards. But what's going to happen when you go back 
you know, and you start saying, hey, here's a Bigfoot head. I shot and killed it. Are you going to be charged with murder? Could you be charged with murder for killing a Bigfoot? Are they uh, because they don't have them classified yet? Uh, if they end up classifying it as part human or something like that and you kill it, could you be charged for murder? Well, that is an interesting question. Very fascinating because here's the, uh, the legal analysis that I see is that if you kill something that technically doesn't exist in any form as far as the government or law enforcement or even society um, says that it doesn't, then are you guilty of murdering uh, something that is not classified as either an animal uh, or a human being? Uh, Then, of course, the flip side of that, if I was the defense attorney out there, or the prosecutor actually, and I was was trying to get somebody uh, put away for something like that, you would point out the fact that the, any any kind of DNA that has been obtained that have been attributed to either hair or uh, parts of the uh, Bigfoot at all supposedly has some human DNA in it. What if uh, there is some kind of a link between hominids and these cryptids called Bigfoot? Uh, then does that need to be reclassified and would you be in trouble? I don't know the answer to that right off the bat, but those are the kinds of things you would definitely want to talk with a lawyer about, even before you went out with that kind of intention, for sure. Yeah, I mean, so if you out there, guys, and you run across a Bigfoot, if you think you're going to be famous, think that situation out first. It could backfire. It really could. I don't know. I mean, I know I remember a story on Art Bell, I'm sure you remember, where he had that hunter on. That, again, that him and his buddies took out, you know, the male and female and supposedly buried it. And he was scared to give out any of the information because he was so scared that he could be, you know, charged uh, with murder. I don't know. Yes, and I I remember listening to that late night uh, story as well. And I remember what really scared him was the fact that once they did kill those two Bigfoot a male and a female, um, it was the, the so, they looked so human to them at the time that they were able to drag them out of the, the forest that, where they were at that that's when they became very frightened of what they did and, and uh, what the repercussions could have been for doing that. So I uh, remember them telling Art that they actually uh, buried both the bodies quite deep and they didn't want to go back again, but... Uh, I think Art was trying to convince him to give them, give him the map of where to uh, have other people go out and get it. But that's a fascinating uh, story and a, a terrible conundrum to be in. Yeah, well, then again, I honestly look at it. If you ran into a Bigfoot and if you shot at it and, and killed it, and if it's any of its, you know, group is around there, I, you know, they're not going to be friendly towards you at that point. You know, they're going to come after you. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I, I can't say it. I, I, I think a, one gun against a couple of Bigfoots are not going to, you know, oh, somebody's alarm just went off in their car down the, by you. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I don't know. I, I would never think about wanting to go out and harm one. I mean, again, you know, when me and my friend were out there, he could have killed us. And I know that. Uh, I, yeah. I, you know, he could have killed me with a heart attack running too, you know, if you would have seen me, <laughs> uh, but I wasn't as fat then. So, but I tell you, uh, it's something that, uh, people need to think about, you know, and, and, uh, it was, I don't know. I, again, well, a, uh, go it's ahead. The same scenario. Yeah. It's the same scenario that we all, uh, uh, experience when we saw the movie uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still, you know, um, with the fact that uh, this alien comes out and uh, and automatically our uh, military tries to shoot it and kill it, and uh, of course the, the reaction from the uh, alien and uh, from the robot was uh, pretty swift and, and deadly itself, but, um, you know, we, we just kind of typically fear the things we don't know. And uh, we drop back to that defensive uh, 
mode sometimes when we shouldn't be uh, so defensive initially uh, 